Good morning, church. Good morning. Welcome to worship. As we begin, before we move into our... So today we're going to begin, we are beginning a new sermon series called True Worship, taken from the Gospel of John chapter 4, when Jesus is with the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman at the well. Um, We already read part of that scripture when we started with our responsive call to worship today. And that song is going to be our theme song throughout this entire series. Listen now to the whole text from the Gospel of John. The woman said to Jesus, our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, but you say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. And Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know, we worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father seeks such as these to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Jesus said, but the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father seeks such as these to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. So two times in this passage, Jesus uses this descriptive phrase for worship that we are to worship in spirit and truth. So between now and Advent, we're going to dig into this phrase, and we're going to bring other texts alongside it, that by God's grace, we will begin to understand what it is that God desires for us as true worshipers as we move then into the season of Advent and Christmas. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we come, we come to worship you. You you have called us here. We admit that sometimes we forget, we don't know what it means to truly worship you. Um, Help us to hear, Spirit. Um, Help us to hear from you today. May your truth find minds that are open and ready to receive and to learn and to be transformed. We pray this together in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So when you're coming to this sanctuary on a Sunday morning, I think that many of us say we're going to church. We get up and we say, you know, you got to get ready for church. We don't necessarily say that we have to get ready for worship. We're, we're going to worship. We usually say that we're going to church. It's not that we don't know we're coming to a worship service. We know that we do, but the word that we use is usually not worship. We usually use the word church. Um, we know that the church is not a place. We know that. That this place is part of the property that God gave to this church 251 years ago that we've been taking care of all of this time. But um, where we are is not the church. Who we are is the church, right? We are the church. I am, you are, we together. We are the church. So that's why I always begin on Sunday mornings with that greeting, good morning, church, as a reminder to you you that that you are, we are together the church. I don't come in here during the week when there's nobody in here and say, good morning, church. The church isn't here. It's an empty building then. So um, I know this is not new information for you, but it's important for us to be reminded of this as we um, begin um, this series. So on Sunday morning, which is the Lord's Day, the church gathers in different places all over the world. And this is World Communion Sunday, and so it's, I think it's lovely to think about all over the world, Christians are gathering in their places of worship um, to come to the table together to, to share the sacrament of communion. But Jesus told the woman of, at the well that, that where you worship is not all that important, that, that where you worship is not all that, that important, it's who you worship, and it is how you worship that is most important. He says, but the hour is coming and is now here, he said, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father seeks such as these to worship him. But the hour is coming, he said, and is now here. So what was there 
that wasn't there before in front of this woman that he had just met at the well is now here. Well, what was there now is Jesus. Jesus was there right then. The Son of God, God himself, came to earth in the flesh to save us from our sins and to save us from worshiping everything and everyone except our Creator. So Jesus is now before this woman, and Jesus is now here, 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 before us, by the power and presence of the Holy Spirit, teaching us, enabling us to listen and to commune with him through his precious blood and and leading us in worship. Jesus is our worship leader. We can't worship the Father without Jesus. But the hour is coming, he said, and is now here. Indeed. For he is here, ready to lead and receive our worship in spirit and in truth. And I think for many of us, this challenges our, our mindset that asks, what's in this for me? And that's, that's the message that the world sends to us all the time. What, what am I going to get out of this? And I've heard many people say that they go to church to get their tank filled up for the week. Maybe you've said that. But what if you don't like the songs that were chosen for that day? Or if the sermon doesn't hit you quite right? I mean, what's the state of your tank? Is the state of your tank empty after you leave, the same as it was when you came in? And then you're prone to say those horrible words, I didn't get anything out of that. Oh. In other words, I could have had my tank filled better if I would have stayed home and drank my coffee on my porch, or maybe stayed home and got some work done and alleviate some stress in my life. That puts a lot of pressure on your church staff. I mean, it's not that, it's not that we aren't responsible for what we're called to do, but if we aren't at the top of our game, you're gonna leave with your tank still on empty? Wow. Something about that doesn't seem quite right when we've all been called here not to watch something but to worship God. As most of you know, as I just said, John and I went to this conference in Nashville um, for several days, a couple weeks ago now, called Sing. And the conference was primarily for pastors and church musicians, um, songwriters, lyricists, to bring a renewed focus on the depth of biblical, spirit-filled content in our times of corporate worship, instead of focusing on, dare I say, performance. And this is a very big deal, especially for churches that have big worship teams and a lot of instruments and multiple singers, etc. cetera. Um, but it, it applies to us too. I'm not here to perform for you. Jonathan and Chris are not here to perform for you. Lori, though it sort of looked like it with the balloons this morning, um, she's got a message there. It's not a performance. Um, A lay reader, it's, it's not a performance. We are all here to be led together, to think about and to meditate upon and to consider deeply and to exalt highly the God who could have turned his back on us, who could have just turned his back on us because of our sin, but didn't, but didn't. Instead, he came. He came to us to show us the way out of the mess that we got ourselves in, to show us the way to holy living, holy living as the church in the world so that we might make an impact in the lives of the people around us. I want to share with you an experience we had after the conference. 
Um, I didn't share with many of you where we were going for our vacation after the conference because it was a secret for our grandchildren and because one of our granddaughters, Taylor, is friends with Shelby and Abby. I was afraid if I put this out there, it would get back to them. Um, but we flew to Disney World and, and met up with our family down there, Molly and Randy and our three grandkids. It was a big surprise to our grandkids that we showed up. And we had such a wonderful time with them, um, just, it's, just to see the, um, the delight in the eyes of kids seeing something new for the first time. Um, but the fruit of so many people's creative labors there on that property, it was, uh, we had a wonderful time. But one day we were waiting in line to see the character Minnie Mouse. And we had been in line for about 30 minutes and Peyton, who's only 17 months old, was basically at the end of her uh, patient's rope. And uh, we were next in line, finally, we were next in line, and all of a sudden, this woman comes over and she has a Disney badge on her chest, and she says, um, pardon me, I'm sorry, but um, would it be okay with you if um, I have these two women over here, could they go ahead of you um, because their picture didn't turn out and they're upset and they want to get their picture retaken because they have photographers there. So, And we were like, uh, well, okay, we have a baby here and we've been waiting, you know. So we were like, what are you going to do? You know, you say, okay. So this woman goes back over to these two women and then in a couple of minutes she comes back over to Taylor and she says to Taylor, who's your favorite princess? Taylor thought for a moment and she said, Cinderella. And this woman says, I'll take you to see her. Ooh. So we were glad that we were gracious and we had given this uh, people, you know, the ability to come and go in front of us. So we were escorted. Our little family was escorted. Oh, there, there we have Minnie Mouse. I thought you might like to see that. But, you know, we finally did. See, isn't she cute? So Minnie, she's so cute. Okay, you can take that off now. All right. <laughs> so... So we're walking outside with this Disney wor worker um, escorting us personally to go see Cinderella of all princesses. And um, we were just talking to her. She was a young woman. She was very interesting to talk to. And at one point, I was just beside her. No one else was around. The kids weren't around. And, um, and I asked her how long she worked for Disney. She said four years. And I said, have you always done this position? No, she had some other positions. And I said, um, have you ever been one of the characters, I asked. And she said, without hesitation, without looking at me to the side and giving me a little wink, nothing, I said, have you ever been one of the characters? And she said, oh no, that would be impossible. And then she just went on to talk about something else. Have you ever been one of the characters? Oh no, that would be impossible. Now think with me. <laughs> it's crazy. Think with me how ingrained it is in every cast member, which is what they call the Disney people. They're not employees. They're all cast members because it's all a big show, okay? Think with me how ingrained it, in, ingrained it is in their minds um, that someone doesn't become a character like Cinderella or Pocahontas or Minnie Mouse or Goofy or whatever, that these characters are who they are, that Minnie is Minnie. She's not Minnie. Someone's not in a Minnie suit, that Ariel is not, you know, Diane from Ohio who happened to have red hair and is wearing an Ariel costume, that Ariel is Ariel is Ariel. What a culture of make-believe. Think about it. What a culture of make-believe is there in the magic kingdom. Oh no, that would be impossible. <laughs> I mean, I'm walking along going, what did she just say? <laughs> As believers in the kingdom of God, which is neither temporary nor magic in any way, shape, or form, I mean, God, as, as citizens of his kingdom, he wants our lives to be pure and true and sold out 24-7 devotion to him and his statutes so that if somebody wanted to pull us into some you know, tearing down somebody else's reputation, or maybe, you know, we were tempted to not forgive somebody for what they, you know, had, had done to us, or maybe we were tempted, people ask us to go out drinking, and, and we knew that the end game of that was, you know, everybody was going to get drunk, 
or in this day and age, and I'm just going to say it, that if someone asks us to take inappropriate, inappropriate pictures of ourselves and send them to ourselves over our phone, our response would be, our response would be with anything is, oh no, that would be impossible for me. Oh no, that would be impossible for me. Because as lovers of Jesus, as those who live in this, we're citizens of the kingdom of God, we're uh, this place of real mercy and real justice, we must be who we are as those who know what Christ has done for us, as those who know what he has done for us, that we must be who we are as sons and daughters of the king of kings. And to do otherwise, you know, it just hurts us. When you're a Christian and you do otherwise, it just hurts you. You've got all this guilt then, and you've got shame that, that gets in there, and, and, and then we start looking for somebody else to blame for our pain, and, and that usually doesn't work very well if you're truly a citizen of the kingdom of God. True worshipers are those whose lives match what they believe, whose lives match, match, match what they believe. True worshipers gather as the church, as we do, to give and to exalt and to build up and to sing and to pray and to anticipate. And then through a spirit that's, that's filled with the truth of Christ's sacrifice and love for us, true worshipers are then compelled to go out and engage in Christ's mission in the world. Worship compels us, true worship compels us to go out and engage in mission to the world. It's this month, October, October 31st, it'll be the 500th anniversary of when Martin Luther nailed those theses or those complaints against the Catholic Church on the door in Wittenberg. And this action launched the Protestant Revolution, which was this momentous religious revolution which brought the Protestant church into being. We have Catholics and we have the Protestant church, all Christians, but we have two different streams here. And ultimately, at the, the deepest level, what was he protesting? He was protesting a church that had made way too much of routines and rituals and exterior ceremony rather than making much of Jesus Christ alone. And it seems that the church in lots of different places um, at this 500-year mark is sort of coming back to that, which a lot of churches have, have gotten on, off track. So this SING conference that John and I went to, 4,500 people encourage us to sing our faith, make sure that we are singing our faith, focusing on the truth of what Christ has done for us, not just singing because we like the song, we like the way it sounds when everybody sings it together, you know, we just, we like the way it makes us feel when we sing it, but to make sure that as an act of worship, as commanded by scripture, that we are singing our faith story that comes from a, a heart that's been convicted that comes from a sense of engagement with God, and also that, that comes from the reality that every act of worship begins with God and his glory, not with me and my need. Every act of worship begins with God and his glory, not with me and my need. It's such a, a gift to us that we get to start with this sermon series with the sacrament of Holy Communion, to think about people all over the world coming together around the table. I mean, how can we not consider the sufficiency of Christ's sacrifice for us as we come to the table this morning? So I pray that by his spirit that um, God will help us to meditate on the truth of what he has done for us as we worship at his table in spirit and in truth. <laughs>